Welcome back. Um, for those of you who don't remember, my name is uh, Reverend Dr. John Helwig. I am Associate Professor of Theology here at Concordia Lutheran Seminary. And it's a pleasure to have you back with us, even as we are talking about a somewhat difficult, somewhat challenging topic, namely that of spiritual warfare. For those of you who haven't had a chance, I encourage you to look at our, the sessions from last week to get a little bit of background. Um, that's just really laying into who is God and how he is he the, the full power really behind everything in the universe, but then how he created the spiritual realm, um, those that we often call angels or the heavenly host, how some of those fell under the leadership of the one that we call the devil and the demons. And so we get into that a little bit. But now, tonight we're going to start looking a bit more at what the Bible says about the spiritual warfare itself and the different events that have happened in Scripture, some of the principles we can learn from that as well. In this session here, we're going to look a bit more at some of the basics and a bit more Old Testament um, and up through Christ and then in his work. And then in the second session tonight, we're going to look at what happens according to the Scriptures after Christ comes. Uh, how do the apostles act? How do we as Christians then join in this battle as well? The first question that we need to ask with this is, how powerful is Satan? There's a lot of theories that go around there, but it's important for us to understand exactly where he fits in kind of the power structure of the world. It's very vitally important we keep it properly understood and not make him more powerful than he is or less powerful than he is. If you're familiar with Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, which is really about spiritual warfare, at the end of the first stanza, Luther writes, On earth is not his equal. And here he's talking about Satan. That if there is up to us, me, you, all, all Christians, all people together, for us to fight Satan on our own, on our power, in our fallen nature, we would be lost. Uh, he is more powerful than we are right now. He is able to do things that we cannot do. But he is less powerful than God, and it's important for us to also keep in mind, he is in fact a defeated enemy. Jesus, through his coming, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, has in fact defeated Satan. And it is in the power of Jesus that we are able to fight him and fight his wiles. Never in our own strength and power, but always in that of God, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we also have to keep in mind that as a defeated enemy, he is, in fact, very dangerous. Um, he's fighting, though he has nothing to lose, because he has nothing to lose. As we look at this, we talk about the spiritual battle that is going on here. What's important for us to understand is that it is truly a battle that is over our salvation. It is one that is about the eternal destiny of mankind. Now, when we do this, we have to understand what are the goals, what is the intention of each of the forces out there. For God, he has made it very clear, uh, most famously in John 3.16, where it tells us, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's what God wants. He gave his own Son, God the Son, came into the flesh, suffered and died and rose again, that we might have eternal life and never perish eternally, but rather have life in Christ. That's entirely what God's desire is. Satan, on the other hand, we always have to remember, is working out of anger, out of vengeance. He's trying to get back at God. What does he want? He wants to hurt God. He wants to thwart God's plans. It's not so much that he wants us to be his allies and on his side in that regard, but rather it's a matter that he wants to hurt God by hurting those that God loves. He wants to hurt God by taking God's plan of salvation and uh, trying to undermine it, drawing us away from it. God, this is why from the very beginning, as we looked at a little bit last time, that he tempted Adam and Eve into, into sin in the fall there in the Garden of Eden. Why? To cause a separation from God and to try to bring them down. And so Satan is out to hurt God and the best way that he can do that, since he cannot take God on directly, is to hurt those that God loves and cause a break between God and those that he has saved. 
Now, as we do this and we, as we move forward, we always have to remember that the warning is clear in Scripture. False prophets will come. There are going to be those who come to try to lead God's people astray, and this is, in fact, part of Satan's design, to lead God's people away from him and into almost anything else. In fact, Satan doesn't really care where else he leads us so long as it is away from faith in Christ. This is prophesied in Scripture, so we're warned about it time and again. And a little bit longer one from Deuteronomy 13, Moses writes, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and he says, Let's go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery, to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And so he is warning that false prophets are going to come. Some may even do miraculous signs. The key clue is, if they are trying to lead us away from the true God, we should not follow. We should reject them and be warned for them. Jesus gives much the same thing. Counted in Matthew 24, verse 24. He says uh, the same thing is also counted in Mark 13, where Jesus warns us that false Christs, and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. That, of course, is what Satan's very goal is, to lead astray as many as possible, if possible, even those God has called to have faith in Christ themselves. This is not a matter of everybody's kind of in a neutral situation, but Satan is trying to pull us away, and he's often doing this, yes, through false prophets, through those who appear to be good Christians, but in fact are trying to lead us astray. Now as we have these basic principles here, we need to take a look at how this all plays out in Scripture in various ways. And so we're going to start off with the battle as we can see it in the Old Testament. But before we do that here, a key principle that I want to have, this is recounted in the New Testament, but this is a a clear scriptural principle, and that is from 1 Corinthians 10, verses 18-21, where it says, Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Now behind this you see what Paul is getting at is, is that when there are false gods in this world, whatever they are, whatever power they have is actually demonic power. Because it is Satan trying to draw us away from the true God. And so when we see in the Bible, and often in the Old Testament, we see the nation of Israel following the true God, rescued by the true God, but being tempted to fall away and follow the ways of other peoples. This is, in fact, satanic plots to try and draw them away from the very path of salvation. And so, if we take a look, for instance, at what's fairly well known, the events of the Exodus, it's very interesting that, first of all, when Moses goes to the Pharaoh and tells him, let my people go, and that he is a prophet there sent by the Lord, by Yahweh, to use the Hebrew name there. The response by Pharaoh is, who is the Lord? Who is this Yahweh? I've never heard of this God before. He must be some small, weak God, because I've never heard of him. He is putting off God as if he's not important, because for as far as Pharaoh is concerned, 
this God apparently isn't important. At least, that's what he thinks at the beginning of it. But he trying to lead people astray, he's just casting off God, really. He's saying, oh, come on, this, this, this Yahweh, this the Lord, isn't an important God, obviously. And why would he say that? Well, as Pharaoh, he is leader of Egypt, which is at this point the superpower in the world. And so he believes that being the superpower, his gods are the most powerful ones. And so if there is this God, uh, the, this Yahweh, this Lord, that's a God of his slaves. It's supposed to be a weak one. And so why should he listen to it? Well, the answer comes in the series of plagues. And we could tease through and look at all of those different plagues if we had time to do that, although I don't want to draw up too much here. But it can be seen as what's called a theomachy. Theomachy is a fancy term for a war between the gods. And what it is, is that the Lord is systematically taking apart the powers of the Egyptian gods and pointing out that they are powerless. He is the true God. He is the one who has all the power. And so, for instance, they worship the Nile as the blood of Osiris. And uh, they think that this is what gives them life. So what does God do? He turns it into blood and brings, in fact, death because they're worshiping the wrong thing. It's interesting to note that early on, the Egyptians that are called magicians, we might consider them actually priests, who are trying to do all kinds of miracles in the name of the Egyptian gods, fall down at times, but there's a battle until the, it's actually the I believe the third plague, where they say, oh, okay, this, that's it, this is the finger of God. This is a power better than anything we've ever seen before. So throughout this, what it is, is it's an exerting of God's power, proving he is the true God, and these other powers, which might be empowered by demonic forces, are really nothing in comparison to him. He is the ultimate authority, he is the ultimate power within the world. And all should bow to him. All should recognize him. And this dismissal, or this dismissive response that Pharaoh gives at the beginning, who is the Lord? Well, by the end, he knows who the Lord is. He's the God who has completely devastated him and is uh, beating up on this previous superpower of Egypt. And he is terrified. The flip side of that, though, is, is for the people of Israel. Their God is the God who rescues them. He is the God who takes them out of slavery and out of slavery to the most powerful people and gives them instead freedom. And in fact, not just freedom in this life, but he's giving them eternal life in Christ, although that's maybe not laid out quite as clearly in that part of Scripture. It certainly becomes clear as we move forward. So we have the Exodus, we have then the time of the wilderness wanderings, I don't want to get too much into that right now, just for time's sake. But then comes the conquest of the Holy Land. When under Joshua, the people of Israel enter into the Holy Land. And here, even here, it's interesting that this is put into a term of spiritual warfare. In Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy being written by Moses shortly before this, but he's preparing the people for entering into the Promised Land. There, Moses writes, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells virgins or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For, the, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations, which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed this. Now this is an important text here in that when you look at the conquest of the Holy Land, with the destruction of Jericho, as we have pictured here on the screen, um, 
and going forward, a lot of times people will look at that and say, oh, well, boy, isn't God horrible because he's commanding them to destroy these other peoples. But here, what Moses is making clear of is it's actually what the real issue is, isn't you know, who lives and dies, but it's rather spiritual warfare. It's about integrity. That the people who they are dispossessing are people who burn their children, offer their children as burnt sacrifices for their gods. They are ones who practice all of these evil arts of divination, fortune telling, interpreting omens, etc. Practices of what we would today call the occult. And they are trying to use those spiritual forces, these forces of darkness, in order to try and control things. And it's because of that, because of these, what God calls abominations, that they're being driven out of the land. And God is giving the land to a people that at least should be more worthy. As you track through the later part of the Old Testament, we find that at times they're not. But they're people who should be following the true God. And so we have to understand even the Battle of Jericho, the Battle of Ai, and all of those others that are recorded in Joshua is really, again, still a battle between the forces of God and the forces of evil. As God is trying to create a place for his holy people to live holy lives in his holy presence. Not only that, but he's trying to create a place that is intended to be a beacon of light to all the rest of the world. It's not that he's trying to exclude everybody else for a while when he doesn't care about them, but he rather wants to create a place where people look and go, there's something really special going on there. They've got a God that loves them. They've got a God who cares for them in unique ways. We should look into that God. We should understand that's really his goal in bringing them into the Holy Land there. Now as we move forward into in Scripture, we have then what can best be called an interesting case of Job. The whole book of Job is probably one of the most challenging books of the Bible to deal with in many ways. Um, and here, I think it's important for us to understand, though, what all is happening in the background, background of this. It starts off with, we learn in the very beginning in Job chapter 1, first it starts off saying, telling us that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Then in, in chapter 1 verse 6, we're told, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does God fear does Job fear God for no reason? You put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased them in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now it's interesting here what is going on. First of all, we are introduced that Job is a righteous man before God, and God is holding a, a council, if you will, before the sons of God, a term that's sometimes used for the angelic host, the, the spiritual host, and Satan comes in, and God points out, look, I, here's, you want to see somebody who's really righteous, who really has faith in me? It's Job. And Satan says, oh, it's because you've been nice to him. I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to destroy his faith if you just let me. And God allows him first to harm Job by taking away his wealth. Then there's a second account where there, um, in uh, chapter 2 we're told, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, 
from going to and fro on earth and walking up and down on it. Notice so far, this revelation is largely a repeat of from chapter 1. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And then God kind of points to Satan and points out he was wrong. He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And so we have the second round, and now he gets affected by terrible sores and that. We're told that Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores, sores, the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And it's interesting in verse 9 then what happens. Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still have to hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's what Satan wants. That's what it's all about. It's about trying to undermine Job's faith in God. And now even his wife is saying, give it up, Job. But we're told that he said to him, you speak as one of the foolish women who speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And we're told that in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so Throughout it, and throughout the rest of the book of Job, or most of it, we have Job lamenting to his friends, and his friends trying to explain, oh, you had to do something to deserve it, um, the problems. But in the very end, we're told that Job was commended by God for being faithful, even though he did grump and complain about God and say it was unfair. But he never turned his back on God. He never cursed God. He continued to cling to his faith in God, even in the midst of it all. And then, so therefore, Satan's attempts from the very beginning of Job were thwarted. Job, or Satan wanted to take Job away from God, and it failed. Job remained steadfast. Another event that we often don't think about as a spiritual battle is the famous one of David and Goliath. The account is, of course, that the, the Philistine army is arrayed up against the people of Israel, and they're lined up ready for battle, and then this champion, Goliath, comes out and challenges to say, you send out a champion to fight me, and whoever wins, the other country will give in to them. But what we need to understand is, is that in the mindset of the ancient peoples, every war, every battle was really a battle not only between their armies, but between their gods, and whoever had the stronger gods was going to win the battle. And so sometimes they had this idea that rather than having a ton of people kill each other and slaughter and maim each other and all of that horrors and bloodshed, we'll each pick one champion to fight for our God and there whoever's God wins, that person is the champion. And it's in this mindset that Goliath is going forward to issue this challenge. But of course we also know that the Philistines in doing this have also tried to stack the deck. They've picked the biggest, toughest, meanest warrior out there. Someone who is, by our standards, physically a giant, a hardened warrior. Somebody that when he comes out and says, who wants to take me? Absolutely every soldier in the Israeli armor, or in the Israelite army, rather, has the same idea, and that is, not me. <laughs> They're all terrified. And so who steps forward but this young boy, David, and he comes out, he's not even wearing armor. He's not a trained soldier, he doesn't ha know how to wear armor and how to work in armor. He doesn't have traditional weapons, anything. And of course Goliath laughs at him. But David understands, this is a battle between the gods, between the true God, his God, the God of Israel, and the false God of the Philistines. And so he comes out, and in the name of the Lord, he takes on Goliath, and of course, everybody knows how that turned out. David wins the battle, cuts off Goliath's head, and the victory goes to the Lord. This is, in fact, a proof of the power of the Lord, that he is the one who's going to win, even though, by all earthly standards, the battle should go to Goliath and the Philistines. It goes to the Lord. But then, as we move forward, there's an interesting 
turn of events that happens just after this here in uh, 1 Samuel. And this is what happens to King Saul. Saul, we're told, turns away from God. He has been seeking to do sacrifices for his own benefit um, rather than waiting for the priests. He's not listening to God. He's not following God's commands. And so as a result, God had had David anointed as the next king, though Saul doesn't know that yet. But in 1 Samuel 16, we're told, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now this is kind of interesting here. It's a harmful spirit, a demonic spirit, but the Lord is sending it. The Lord allow it, is allowing this to come to torment Saul for his abandonment of his faith in God. We're told, And Saul's servants said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well, and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. He knows he's a man of war because David's already defeated Goliath here. And so David comes and he serves Saul. He serves him, yes, in a warrior capacity as his armor bearer and then later leading his armies. But what's interesting is, is that we're told that whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Of course, we have to put together a few things from Scripture, but we know that David wrote many songs. The songs that David wrote, we know as the Psalms. And so David there, was, when he's singing to Saul, isn't just kind of singing nice little calming, tra-la-la type songs. He is actually singing psalms. He is singing the praises of the Lord, and that is what drives out the evil spirit and settles down Saul. And so, even here, we see this interesting spiritual battle taking place for the very soul of Saul. And God is trying to use the evil spirit to torment Saul enough that he's going to listen to the Psalms from David so that maybe he will repent of his abandonment return to faith, and be saved. And so this is far more of a spiritual battle than we often look at. Yes. Then the battle continues then in Daniel, and we see it probably most overtly in the book of Daniel as far as the spiritual battle happening in the Old Testament. Here in Daniel chapter 10, we're told, that, uh, first of all, a little background here. Daniel has seen a vision from God, and he's trying to figure out what in the world does this mean. So he prays for an explanation. And an angel is sent to Daniel to give that explanation. But we're told that the angel, this is the angel speaking, or said to, to Daniel, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. This is a fascinating little insight into this spiritual battle here, as God has sent this angel with the message to explain to Daniel the visions that God had given Daniel, but he's being stopped by this prince of the kingdom of Persia, and what's later referred to as kings of Persia. These would be demonic forces that are over Persia and trying to control those people there. And they are trying to hinder him, and he needs the help from the mighty fighter, the archangel Michael, to rescue him from this. 
Michael, interestingly, a little bit later in this chapter, as well as in chapter 12, is referred to as the great prince in charge of Israel. He is the one that God has put in charge of, God, of taking care of God's own people, Israel. And so when this messenger, angel, literally Angelos, this remember from last time, is trying to get there and he's being hindered, Michael comes then to help him so that he can succeed in his task. But one of the things that we can overlook here, if we're not careful, is that the real battle, the real intention here, isn't about whether or not this angel can carry out his message. It's about God's word coming to Daniel, and through Daniel, written down to all of us in Holy Scripture. It's not just a, you know, kind of, well, there's a, this interesting battle going on in, in Persia and all of that. That's a side story. What it really is about is, is that God is sending his word to his people through, in this case, the prophet Daniel, and that the evil forces are trying to stop it. This should always or be a hint to us as to what's going on here. One of the primary targets that Satan is after is God's word. He's trying to target God's people, but he's also trying to stop God's word from going out because that is what creates faith. That is what gives us faith and life in Christ is through his word. So that's what Satan is really trying to fight after. And so when we do occasionally see these other glimpses going on, we need, to be a little, we need to be a little careful here and not make it all about this battle for Persia and lose sight of the fact that all that was really about was try, Satan trying to ham, hamper the word of God coming to Daniel. And this message of prophecy, message ultimately that's going to point to great kingdoms to come, but then an even greater kingdom rising up in the midst of it, that is being the New Testament church. And so there's that message that is the very message that is trying to be stopped, but cannot be stopped because God's forces are the greater ones. In Daniel, we also see other events. We see, for instance, the battle is, Daniel is tried to be forced into idolatry, as are his three friends that we know by their Babylon, better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you might recall that case where they are cast into the fiery furnace, and then they see not three, but four walking around there, one looking at a son of the gods. An angel was sent there to rescue them. But even there, I didn't put it on the slide, but I think it's a fascinating thing to note. The great confession that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave before they went into the fiery furnace, namely that their God, the true God, has the power to rescue them from the fiery furnace. Not that he necessarily would, but they know that he has the power. And whether or not he was going to rescue them didn't matter. They were going to be faithful to him. And that's the real message for us. We hold fast to him. And whether or not he chooses to deliver us from that problem by saying, sending some kind of help, either miraculous like an angel or more normal help, or if he chooses to rescue us by taking us out of this life, as long as we remain faithful to him, he in fact gives us that rescue. Another interesting point of discussion in the Old Testament comes up actually in Zechariah. This is often overlooked in the book of Zechariah. Um, God has is bringing his people out of captivity, after the Babylonian captivity, and he's reestablishing them, but there seem to be a lot of impurities and problems within his people. And so, Zechariah sees a vision. He sees this, that is recorded in Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. 
And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now this is actually a fascinating insight into what's going on in the spiritual realm. God has this, his priest, his chosen high priest, Joshua. Interesting cho choice of names. Joshua means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. And that Hebrew word, Yeshua, is going to be, we're going to find, um, if you take it into Greek, is Jesus or Jesus. Um, it's the same name. Not that this individual is Jesus, but it's fascinating that this is the name of the high priest. But he's standing there, and Satan is the accuser. He is accusing him, and he's pointing to Joshua and pointing out his sin, pointing out his guilt. And that is represented by these filthy garments. That he is filthy. He's been drugged through the mud. And a lot of the filth is, the filth is his own, really. And so Satan is accusing him. But the response is God rebukes Satan takes off the dirty robes and puts on clean robes, gives him clean garments. He takes away his sin and clothes him with righteousness so that he can now stand pure. And so as a result, he has been, he's been purified and set right before God and no longer can be, offend, can be accused. Now he can be the high priest. He can work in the temple and all of that. But it's a beautiful illustration here that we have of how this all works. Satan sees us. He sees our guilt. He points to that filthiness we have on us. And God rebukes him and says, Take away the filth. I'm going to clothe you with righteousness, with my righteousness. And so then, he makes us righteous before God. How does he do this? Well, we turn to the New Testament and we see Jesus entering into the battle. And this is God's ultimate answer. As we talked about last time, when we talked about the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3, God promised right there at the fall that he would send the seed of the woman to defeat, um, defeat the serpent. And so finally he does it in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is the greatest answer, this is the greatest move in the entire spiritual battle. With this, we have to start with understanding, quite frankly, the miracle of the Incarnation. Sometimes as with Christmas we get all caught up with the baby Jesus, which is wonderful in that. But we lose sight of the fact that what this is, is this is a truly an incredible thing. One of the most, possibly the most amazing thing, definitely the most amazing thing to happen up in this, to this time in history. God became flesh. God the Son became a human being. God became one with us, that he might save us. Now when we put this in terms of the spiritual battle, we have to remember that God created the world perfect. And he created humanity originally sinless so that he could be with us, so that he could walk with us in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, here in this world. The serpent came, tempted Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, and since then, much of this world has been under the power of the devil. And uh, he has his ways with pulling people away from faith in Christ and pulling people away from God, the true God and that. So what's happening here? Well, in the person of Jesus, God the Son is stepping into Satan's turf. He's coming into this world and he's saying, I'm going to take care of this problem once and for all myself. God doesn't send somebody else. It's not just a prophet. He doesn't send somebody that he's anointed in some wonderful way to, to do this. He himself becomes a human being, enters into this world, in order that he might bring salvation. 
And with this, we always have to remember here, as um, this picture here is of the visit, shows the visit of the Magi, what was the next thing that happened? But the plot by Herod to try and kill the baby Jesus. To kill the, you know, all of the innocents of the area were killed. But the idea is we'll kill them all, and hopefully then we'll get, get this newborn king. Why? Well, I mean, there's reasons for Herod himself, who is a very powerful but also rather paranoid individual. But there's also, I think, a spiritual side to this, where Satan is going, if I can kill that God in the flesh as a baby, I can take care of the problem now. But of course, God thwarts it by a vision to Joseph, and so the Holy Family leaves, and Jesus is saved. And uh, Satan's attempt to kind of cut him off at the pass clearly fails. It's not, though, until Jesus comes into his full ministry as an adult that we then see him actively involved in this battle. He is involved in the spiritual battle all along, though, in that he is living a sinless life. And he's living that sinless life, the one that you and I fail to do daily. He is doing perfectly. So he's already involved in some ways, but then he comes into it more. First he is baptized, but what's interesting is, is what happens immediately after Jesus' baptism. Then we have the temptation of Jesus. From Matthew um, chapter 4, we're told of the account. Um, it's also in Luke. But uh, Matthew, using Matthew's account here, we're told that then Jesus was led by the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I've always thought that has to be the biggest understatement in the entire Bible. He's been fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and he's hungry. He's obviously famished. He's very hungry. Satan knows this and knows that Jesus, while true God, is also truly human. He's hungry. He's hurting, quite literally, here. And so, we're told, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. In essence, if you are the Son of God, prove it by performing a miracle and a, and a selfish miracle. Do it for yourself. You know, we have to keep in mind that it's very different here for Jesus to do it just selfishly as opposed to when he feeds the 5,000 and when he feeds the 4,000, where he's imagined he is doing it, but he's doing it for the good of others. Here's Satan saying, be selfish, do it for yourself. But, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here he's quoting from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And so he thwarts this, saying, there's something far more important than physical bread, and that is God's word. And he's not going to turn his way from that. Then the devil told, took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now the, the point on the temple that Jesus is at is kind of over, not only the edge of the temple, but it's over a cliff. So it's a huge drop off. But Satan is saying, prove that you are the Son of God. And Satan quotes scripture. And this is one of the things we always have to remember about him, is that he twists God's words. And his, what, exactly what he's doing here. Again, trying to make it for selfish things. And we're told, Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16 in this case that Jesus is quoting. Then we're told again, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. The temptation here, in some ways, is, is the most bold, to be sure. But it's, here's the easy way. I'll give you all glory, all earthly power. Just compromise one little time here. But of course, Jesus again has the answer. He, Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, 
You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Here he's quoting Deuteronomy 6.13. We're told, Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now, as we see this whole event play out, and this big battle that's going on here, it's important to understand what's going on. The first temptation that Adam and Eve had, that we talked about last week, was, You shall be like God. And so now, well, Jesus doesn't have to be like God. He is God. But the temptation is kind of so, how do you adapt that to him? Prove that you're God. Take the glory. And Jesus instead is humbling himself and saying, no, I'm taking the place of humanity under God's law. I'm not going to take the glory to myself. I'm not going to use the power for myself. I'm going to use the power to save instead. And so he moves forward. But the other thing that is really powerful here is that this is God we're talking about here. This is the one who could literally, the only one who could literally go to Satan and go, and flick him off, you're gone. But he doesn't do that. He defeats him with using God's word. He quotes scripture to Satan, and that's how he defeats him. And why does he do it that way? Basically because Jesus is fighting Satan with the tools that we have available to us. If he had defeated Satan's temptations by just saying, be gone, get out of here, you're nothing, well, that doesn't help us at all, because I can't do that. But what you and I can do is we can cling to God's word, we can quote God's word. And so Jesus is using the very weapons that he has given to us to fight with, and he is defeating Satan there. Both defeating Satan filling in where we have failed and continue to fail. But also, he's showing us the way. This is how you do it. Not with some great incantation, not with some great act of power and might. Quote scripture. Cling to God's word, and that's how you defeat Satan. As we move forward from here into the life of Jesus, we find that he is regularly at battle with the demonic forces. We can see this in a number of places. I've got a few examples here um, from Mark chapter 1. We're told that Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were all astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And then the clean spirit, convulsing him, and cried out, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. But at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So we see that when Jesus comes into account and uh, comes into contact with the demonic forces, because they are spiritual forces, they see the spiritual reality of what's going on here. They see not only his humanity, but his divinity. And quite honestly, they're afraid. You notice? You know, what do you have to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? They know that their destruction is coming, and that. And so they fear Jesus. And Jesus, in his power then, frees this man by commanding him, or by commanding the unclean spirit, the demon, to get out of him, and so he does. In Mark 3, um, we find just a quick account here that this happened a fair bit, obviously, because it says, whenever unclean spirits saw Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now one of the uh, more dramatic events that we find comes from Luke chapter 8. We're told that Jesus and his disciples sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, um, op, which is opposite Galilee. This is across the Sea of Galilee. And it says, When Jesus stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. 
And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to enter these. So he gave them permission, and the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and, he rushed, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Um, and the, the account goes on from there, but for time I'll stop. The people are amazed, though, when they come out and find this demon-possessed man now in his right mind. They're terrified by what happened uh, because they couldn't do anything about it. And then Jesus comes in and casts out the demon. Uh, that, not demon, but demons, legion. Legion, that means a thousand. So there's many, many demons who are in this poor individual. They go into the herd of pigs and with demonic fervor to destroy, immediately drown the pigs. Um, and the people therefore are scared of that. And, but Jesus wins this. There's another interesting account then from Luke chapter 11. Uh, we're told that uh, here Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out of the mute, man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the king of demons. And while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a, kingdom fall, a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebul. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor, in which he trusted, and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So it's interesting, this whole account here, where Jesus casts out a demon, people accuse him of, oh, it's just a show. You know, you're pretending to cast out demons by the power of Satan because you're actually on, in league with them. And Jesus says, no, that's not right at all. And in fact, he uses this illustration then of a stronger man. And what's important for us to understand is that Satan is the strong man. He and his possessions are humanity. But Jesus is the stronger man who comes, binds Satan, and rescues us. And that is the great message of hope that he's bringing forward here. But of course, Jesus' work isn't done yet. Satan continues to try to stop Jesus, and as we talked about a little bit last time, that Satan entered into Judas so that Judas would betray Jesus. Again, with the hope, much like he did with Herod, that Satan's thinking, well, if we can get Jesus killed and get rid of him, then finally we're going to be rescued. We know, of course, by hindsight, that this was in fact God's plan all along, that Jesus would be arrested, he would be tried, and that he would suffer and die, that we might be saved. But we have to remember, Satan's trying to stop the proceeding here. But it all leads to a very surprising climax on the cross. Here we have to understand that the spiritual battle takes a turn that Satan could not have imagined. This is why I mentioned last time, I keep thinking when Jesus is on the cross, that Satan thinks, oh no, I, I made a terrible mistake. But the interesting thing is, is the key battle that's happening here, this battle that is ha taking place, this ultimate spiritual battle, is not between God and Satan. It's between God and God. Not that God is somehow divided against himself, but it's God's plan. And what I mean by this is, is that God, in his wrath on our sin, and how we have fallen under control of the devil, 
he pours it out upon God the Son. Not taking out his wrath on Satan, not taking his wrath out on us, even though we most certainly deserve it. But he pours it instead upon his Son. He takes it upon himself. Taking that wrath upon himself, suffering and dying under his own wrath, so that we might be forgiven. So that the power of Satan to accuse us is taken away. So that we, like the high priest Joshua, as we saw in Zechariah, can have the filthy garments of our sinfulness taken off of us, and the righteousness of Christ placed upon us. Why? Because God poured out his wrath, the last place that Satan expected it to be poured out. He took it upon himself that we might be forgiven, that we might have life and salvation in his name. This is the crux of it all. Ultimately, if we want to boil down everything, where does it all come down to in spiritual warfare? It's our Lord and Savior suffering and dying on the cross for our sake taking the blame, taking the separation from God that we deserve upon himself, that we might be redeemed. Looking then very briefly then at uh, what comes after this, then. we're told from 1 Peter, in a rather cryptic thing, 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, when the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now we need to always be careful. We don't know too much about what this means. And in fact, the formula of Concord even warns us we shouldn't try to postulate as to when exactly did Jesus go down to hell and um, what form did he do it, how did he do it. Scripture doesn't tell us that. But what he does do is he goes into, into hell and he proclaims his victory. He goes into hell and declares, proclaiming to the spirits in prison, those who refuse to listen to the preaching all the way back under Noah, because Noah was a prophet as well, as well as, we have to assume, all of the, the preaching of the other prophets, those who had rejected it and said, see, here is the answer. That promise has been fulfilled through my death and resurrection. And he's doing it right there in hell where Satan can't do a thing about it. And then, though, too, at the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry, his physical ministry, which is found in the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, we're told, Jesus came and said to the disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all names, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded with you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then Jesus is ascends up into heaven. And so he leaves them with this message. Because of the victory over the power of Satan, the power of sin, the power of death, the power to accuse us, since he has won that victory, now all authority over heaven and earth has been given to him. He is the one who is reigning and ruling over all things. When we say in the Creed that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, he's not sitting down with his feet up and relaxing, but rather this is the position of authority and rule and power. And as he's doing this, he sends his disciples out with that power now to take it out into all the world. And how are they to do it? Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there he brings forward that power into future generations and even unto us. Well, thank you very much. We're going to take a, a little bit of a break here, and we'll pick up in about 10, 15 minutes. So if you're watching this uh, live, please uh, feel free to take a breather, get yourself uh, you know, a snack or whatever. Um, if you're watching this recorded, then you can start right into the next one. In our next um, installment that we're going to look at then, the, what happens after the ministry of Christ. 
How did the apostles take the um, take on this spiritual warfare? How did they apply what Jesus won after that? And then how do we do the same thing? So please uh, tune in uh, next time, and uh, we thank you for your continued interest and your support of us here at Concordia Lutheran Seminary. God's blessings to you.